As time passes and technology improves, warships that went missing during the two world wars are now slowly being found again. One of the most successful and high profile efforts behind these discoveries is a privately funded effort named the Lost 52 Project. The aim of that is to locate the remainder of America's World War II submarines that have yet to be found, the majority of which were lost in the Far East. At the time of writing, they've successfully managed to find the resting place of 11 of these vessels, and in doing so have brought massive amounts of closure to the families of the crews who were lost with them. But it's not the fate of an American submarine that completely captured my imagination from a young age. It was a French submarine named the Sercouf. Throughout naval history, there are various ships that were designed which have served very little practical use once they've eventually been constructed. These include the doomed 19th century battleship HMS Captain that was built with a series of bizarre rotating gun turrets in the side of a hull and these allowed the sea to pour in uh, and sink her in the first heavy weather she ever experienced. The same would be true of British and American trials with the idea of torpedo rams, a concept that took so long to create from when they were first thought of that these ships were completely outmoded by fast firing guns the second they were launched. Sadly, for the crew of the Sukhouf and a number of other similar designs, it too would end up numbered against these disappointments. Constructed by the French Navy during the interwar years, Sukhouf was designed with a heavy gun emplacement integrated directly into the top of a hull. This pressurised turret housed two side-by-side guns capable of firing the 60 18-inch shells the boat was provisioned with up to a range of 26 kilometres. In addition to this turret, the 120-metre-long Behemoth was also equipped with a working seaplane, two motor launches, anti-aircraft guns and 10 torpedo tubes. She could travel up to 18,500 kilometres and was designed with a cargo compartment that could accommodate up to 40 passengers or prisoners. In essence, she was designed with one purpose and one purpose only in mind, to be a covert heavy weapons platform. She could arrive at a destination completely undetected, surfacing in close proximity to any target, land or sea, and then peppering that target with her main cannon before again withdrawing. The only problem was that the idea of an underwater battleship had already been attempted over a decade before by the Royal Navy and it had ended in complete failure. The British M-Class sub had been designed along very similar lines with a single 12-inch gun turret built into the top of a hull. First of the class to be constructed was designated the M1 It was completed in 1917, but launched too late to play any active part in the Great War. The ship was soon found to suffer from persistent leaks in the gun turret, and the permeating seawater severely damaged the gun any time any effort was made to fire it. In 1925, the M1 was struck by a merchant ship while submerged in the English Channel on training exercise. The impact of this collision easily tore the turret completely free from the hull and instantly flooded the sub and killed everyone on board. Unable to reverse the issues that had been found to affect the guns on the M-Class, the decision was then made to pull it out and to adapt the space into a hangar for a scout aircraft. So after ongoing a refit, the M2 was then relaunched under the accolade of being the world's first underwater aircraft carrier. But only four years later, she too was lost with all hands just off the Dorset coastline when her crew failed to secure the hangar door properly before diving. Efforts to turn the third boat in the class into a mine layer proved unsatisfactory, and that was the end of the Royal Navy 
deviating from a conventional sub design. The headline being, if you bolt a large metal room on top of your sub, it just massively increases the chances that something's going to go wrong and flood the ship. Sadly, nobody seems to have bothered to send that memo to the French Navy. Sukuf was somewhat predictably found to be quite a flawed design from the moment she was launched in 1929. It took far too long to ready and aim the guns from the point that the boat surfaced, and having to use the periscope as a rangefinder was a disaster and effectively halved her firing range. In addition to this, the timing of firing the guns had to compensate for the pitch and roll of the boat in the water, meaning that any form of rapid or repetitive fire was virtually impossible. The turret couldn't be fully traversed to the left or the right. By doing that, it redistributed the boat's weight to the point where it formed a roll that was big enough to sink the sub in any kind of heavy water or rough sea. And it didn't take long for the French Navy to realise that this was just an incredibly bad idea. There had been two planned sister ships and they were quickly cancelled, meaning that Sukuf herself was the only one of her class ever to be constructed. When the Germans invaded France in 1940, Sukuf was undergoing a refit at Brest rather than residing in her home base of Cherbourg. Despite having only one functioning engine and a damaged rudder, her captain chose to set sail and he surrendered his ship to the British in Plymouth. She was still moored there in July of that year when the Royal Navy made the decision to sink or seize all of the French ships in order to prevent them falling into the hands of the Kriegsmarine. Three days after British forces attacked what remained of the French fleet in Algeria, several boarding parties of British marines rushed the French ships that were moored up in Plymouth. When the crew of the Surcouf resisted, there was a violent altercation on board the ship, which resulted in three dead British servicemen uh, and one of the French crew. As a result of this, the captain and all of his crew, with the exception of 16 volunteers, were detained and then repatriated back to Vichy, France. British engineers who analysed Sukuf bemoaned how completely ineffective it was as a weapon, to the extent that the Admiralty asked that it be scrapped. Unfortunately, Charles de Gaulle uh, and many other members of the French government in exile saw the ship as a, a symbol of their freedom, meaning that politically, this just wasn't an option. Suffering from repeated mechanical failures and staffed by an inexperienced crew scrounged from other ships, Sukuf was ordered to operate in the Atlantic as a convoy escort. But this mission was marred by an unfortunate encounter with a Norwegian ship that sent out a uh, bizarre SOS message and claimed the French sub had attacked her. That incident was later explained away by a communications issue with the Sukuf's captain stating he hadn't fully understood the signals that the tanker had sent him. But wherever they sailed, suspicion followed, and many in the Royal Navy questioned the loyalty of Captain Pierre Ottoli and his executive officer, Louis Blaison. In truth, neither officer was particularly confident in their own abilities or those of the crew, and they elected to deny the men shore leave to try and undergo additional training and repairs. This move only further raised suspicions that they couldn't be trusted and that they were planning to sail back to Vichy, France and surrender to the Germans. In December 1941, in an effort to improve relations, the boat was allowed to support the invasion of the Vichy islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. And it was here, whilst operating in the Caribbean, that she ultimately met her fate. On the morning of February 12th, 1942, Sukuf departed from the port of Bermuda with orders to make her way across the Caribbean Sea to the Panama Canal. It had been decided that she was best served assisting the French Navy in the Pacific amidst predictions of a Japanese assault on Tahiti. Suffering from issues with her electric motors, she was advised to conduct the journey on the surface. And this was the last time she'd ever be seen. Her disappearance prompting a barrage of accusations and conspiracy theories. A formal investigation into the disappearance 
focused on a reported collision between an American tanker named the Thompson Likes and an unknown ship. Captain Henry Johnson alleged that on the evening of February 18th, his ship was been travelling about 120 kilometres north of Colon when uh, a light had been sighted up ahead. Moments later, the ship was shaken by a hard impact, along with what felt like an explosion at the bow. Captain Johnson ordered a stop and then waited for daylight at that spot, searching for any evidence of what had taken place before then returning to port. It was later alleged some of his crew had seen a long, dark shape in the water at the point of impact, but no wreckage and no survivors were ever recovered. Given that both ships were travelling along the same route in opposing directions and the time of the collision, it was therefore agreed that the ship had most likely sunk the Sukuf in an accident. But many who've researched the incident claim the damage to the front of the American vessel was fairly minor and it should have been a lot greater if she'd hit something as big as Sukuf. They also claim that both ships would have had to deviate pretty largely from their intended courses in order to meet, meaning it was unlikely to be Sukuf that had been hit. There are some other possibilities, um, in particular the post-war records of the American 6th Heavy Bomber Group, who claimed they carried out an attack on the morning of the 19th of February on an unknown submarine. Three of the squadron's aircraft reported attacking and sinking uh, an unknown large enemy submarine, which had been sighted 50 kilometres to the northeast of the Panamanian control zone. It's been ascertained that the American squadron would not have been formally notified of the submarine's journey, and the fact that the target wasn't submerged at the time would be consistent with Sukuf having been ordered to travel on the surface. Of equal interest, other than friendly fire, is a report that some days later, a pair of American submarines attacked and sunk two enemy submarines they'd encountered in Long Island Sound. The ships in question were the USS Mackerel and the USS Marlin, and their captains later described the two targets as a conventional German U-boat and a much larger mystery submarine that was refuelling it. Kriegsmarine naval records don't suggest any German U-boat was present or sunk in that area at the time, which has prompted suggestions that one of the two that was sunk may have been Sukuf. Other suggestions, which similarly assert that the French ship was destroyed whilst trying to defect, claim that the FBI were aware the British attached time mines to her hull to stop this from happening. Having deviated from a course, she eventually sank off the island of Martinique and was lost with all hands when these mines detonated. To date, the wreck of the Sukuf has never officially been found. There have been a number of witnesses, including Jacques Cousteau, who claim to have discovered it and secretly dived on the wreck. It's possible that an effort similar to the Lost 52 may attempt to locate her remains out in the Caribbean Sea at some point in the future, though diving conditions there are suspected to be very, very hazardous. Or possibly even a similar effort could be conducted off the Panamanian coast. That's where the sub may have eventually met her end, having limped there following the collision with the Thompson Likes. Like so many other missing wartime wrecks, only time really will tell. <laughs>